In this video we will be concerned with looking at measuring business performance and towards the end of the, the video we will look at the three E's of measuring business performance. We'll talk about those later. So let's start. Um, managers need to know how effective their policies and strategies are and they need to have performance indicators. If managers can't work out how effective their policies are, then the managers may be making suboptimal decisions. Managers may be making mistakes and perhaps they're not being picked up until uh, it's too late, until it, they're manifest in lower profits or dwindling market. So it's important that the managers know how effective their policies and their strategies are and that they have performance indicators. Now the performance indicators may indicate the need for planning and policy reassessment. So a performance indicator, whatever the, the indicator selected is, it may show that some remedial action is required on the part of the manager to put right some decision or some action which was detrimental to the, the welfare of the business. So policy reassessment and policy planning and replanning are very much important within the context of performance indicators and the use of performance indicators. If the management don't learn from the performance indicators, if they don't pay heed to the performance indicators, there's no point in having them. But also, it's a dangerous route to take. The performance indicators show there is something wrong and there is a need on the part of the manager to take some action to fix whatever is going wrong. The performance indicator of course could also indicate something going well, in which case the manager uh, again should know that the, the policy is a success and continue with that policy. So performance indicators are very important uh, as a, a means of feeding back information to the managers and to the directors of the business as to how their policies are working in practice. Of course remuner remuneration may be based on performance indicators. Uh, people may be paid bonuses if the company is doing well and making more profits or expanding the market or introducing new uh, new items, consolidating the market or uh, outmaneuvering the, the competition. So remuneration may be based on performance indicators. So issues in performance measurement. Well, first of all, what has been uh, measured? It's necessary to work out what's been measured. Um, there are, in a sense, two answers to that. The policy has been measured, the effectiveness of the policy has been measured, but it's been measured through something else, it's been measured through perhaps changes in profitability or changes in sales, changes in market size, market share. So the performance is measuring the effectiveness of some policy or some decision, but it's measuring it in the context of some particular measure. Next, how often should it be measured? Should it be measured every week or uh, every every year or every month? How often should it be measured? What's the optimum? And how should it be measured? Uh, should it be measured using financial data or by taking feedback from customers or uh, talking to the marketing section about their assessment of how the product is doing in the market and how should it be measured. So we have the the what is being measured question and we have the how often should it be measured and how should it be measured and these are important. Measurements suggest measurability. So generally speaking quantitative data um, for example sales orders per month would be used as a performance indicator to see how well a particular strategy is working, a particular perhaps a 
marketing strategy is working. Qualitative data could be measured in terms of the effectiveness of, let's say, training programs. Qualitative data is uh, looser data. It, it's, it's picked up by interviewing people, by observations, by uh, working with people and get, uh, trying to gain their experiences and uh, what they feel about the particular policy or the direction in which the business is moving. So that's qualitative data. It's, it's not quantitative. It's not measurable in that sense, but it's, it's picked up and it addresses the questions that are asked of it, but they answer the questions differently. They're not answering it in quantitative terms. They're answering it in almost emotional terms. They're talking about their, their feelings about the policy and what they think about it. There's also a financial issue. Performance uh, measurement is costly. And the benefits of measurement must be balanced against the cost. It's, it is true to say that um, performance measurement is an additional expense within the business. But it's an important expense because without it, as I said, the effectiveness of policies cannot be properly gauged, cannot properly be, be worked out. But the benefits of measurement must be matched against the cost of the measurement. If the benefits exceed the costs, it's a good idea. If the costs are likely to exceed the benefits, then perhaps performance measurement should not take place. The most basic question is what to measure. Uh, output per worker per week, that may be um, one, one way of measuring uh, performance, looking at the output per worker per week, the output per department per week, or the output of the organization per month. It's setting up something that can be measured and which will indicate whether a particular policy is being effective or not. You could look at machine breakdown in minutes per month. That could be a performance measure. Uh, a measure of how well the maintenance department look after the machines and um, and how, how they, they keep the machinery running perhaps within the business. Um, it could be staff absenteeism per month. How many days off have the staff taken and and why? Is it because the job is not attractive, because the job is boring, uh, because the, the work needs to be enlarged or enriched in some way. Well, why, are, why are people taking time off? What's the sales revenue per month? How well is the business doing per month? Uh, it's perhaps the number of sales orders and the value of those orders, which is an indicator of the success of a policy, perhaps a, a marketing policy. Look at the stock turnover per month. That might be a useful measure of uh, performance. So the problem is, well, labor productivity equals output per worker per time period. Let's just put all of them on. Um, for example, a typist may accurately, accurately type 20 words per minute in the 1950s. A typist today may accurately type 40 words per minute. So productivity appears to double, but actually capital has improved. So when we talk about performance measurements, when let's say we take productivity as uh, a particular measure, we look at the productivity of the workers. And if the productivity is increasing, it's tempting to say that the workers have become more pr productive. But it could be that the machines have become more productive, not the workers. In fact, if the machines uh, are very clever in terms of their programming and the software that drives the machines and they're very advanced machines, the chances are the worker's contribution has been diminished. The worker may be reduced to turning it on and turning it off, whereas in the past it was a skilled job. 
but now perhaps the machine can do it and can do it more efficiently. So instead of talking about labour productivity, perhaps we should be talking about capital productivity. In fact, it's very difficult to separate out the two because if there's no nobody to turn on the machine nothing will happen so people are needed on the other hand once the machine is up and running perhaps the machine can do a lot on its own it's automated it has robotic elements to its uh, capabilities so it's a tricky question when we talk about labor productivity performance measures may be analysed under three headings commonly known as the three E's. These are economy, efficiency and effectiveness. Now these are the three E's of measuring business performance. So performance measures may be analysed under three headings commonly known as the three E's. Economy, efficiency and effectiveness. We'll start with economy. This is concerned with the acquisition of resources for the business. It may be related to hiring appropriate staff, purchasing raw materials or components. Uh, there is a danger in this process, that of focusing too much on the cost of the input. But um, in terms of economy, uh, it's important that the organization and the individual managers make every effort to hire the most appropriate staff, the ones with the right skills and the ones who can most efficiently deal with the issues within the business. Hiring, if you like, different staff will, less, will lessen the uh, profitability of the business. It will lead to inefficiencies. And there's also um, a problem about dealing with purchasing raw materials or components. Um, so it, it's necessary to, to deal with uh, suppliers in a way that ensures that there's good quality components and raw materials and it's available when required. Perhaps the business is running um, a JIT policy or, or something near a JIT policy, a just-in-time policy. Um, However, there's also a danger in this that the, uh, the, the, the company is placing too much focus, too much emphasis on the cost of the inputs and perhaps ignoring what happens after the inputs have been acquired and happens in terms of pricing and distribution at the other end. So there needs to be a balanced view right throughout the organization it's wrong just to focus in on one part and uh, try to gain all the efficiencies from one part of the organization. It may be more appropriate to make buying decisions based on so-called five rights of purchasing. So trying to get the right quality, the right quantity, the right time, the right supplier and the right price. So these are the five rights of purchasing. It's easy when we write them down. It makes it look an easy task. In fact, it is extremely complicated to achieve in practice. Trying to determine the quality of the inputs, the quality of the purchases, that is extremely complex to make sure that the quality is consistent and to make sure that um, it is the appropriate quality for what is required. Getting the right quantity, making sure that the deliveries are on time and that they are the right quantity and making sure that the supplier is reliable and uh, will honour the, the order and the terms of the order and that the price is correct and that the price means that the the items purchased enable the business to work on the inputs and generate a profit at the end. So let's look at the the right quality for the start, the, the, the first point. We'll come back to this slide and look at the right 
quantity, the right time, the right supplier, and so on. Let's look at the right quantity. No, sorry, quality. Buying on the basis of price alone risks problems in each of these categories. So quality. Cheaper purchase may lack quality. So it may be a false economy. So it's important to make sure that the items purchased are suitable. Not necessarily the cheapest. But they have to be suitable for what they're purchased for. It, cheaper items may not be appropriate and may lead to additional costs and may lead to poor quality in production or may lead to machine breakdowns or may lead to uh, wastage. So it's a false economy to just buy the cheapest. The right quantity. Well, um, larger orders may attract discounts this may encourage overstocking with associated costs. So although larger orders may may carry a discount, if you buy more you get get it for less, but then the company has perhaps sunk a lot of resources into the order and they have to hold stock. Well the stock is idle. The stock is not producing anything. It's not yielding a return. It's just sitting in the stores waiting to be used. So although the company got a discount on the purchase, it must balance that with the idea of having to overstock the product. So not necessarily a good thing to place a bigger order, even though there are discounts. Clearly, of course, this would have to be calculated. You'd have to work out the, the cost, sorry, the savings from large discounts versus the, the costs of overstocking. Now the right time. Well care must be taken in the timing of orders and reordering stock. Orders placed early will lead to idle stock and associated in, uh, increased costs. So it's a question of getting the timing right as well. The, the orders have to be placed uh, with the supplier so the supplier will, allowing for lead time, will supply when the company needs the items. If the company is overcautious and they place the order too soon, it'll carry extra stock for that period, and that's a waste of resource. There is an opportunity cost, if you like, because the resource has gone into paying for the order that's arrived early, could have been put into the bank at a rate of interest, which would be more productive. On the other hand, if the company waits too long before it places the order, trying to minimise stock holding, it may be that the order arrives late, in which case machines are standing idle, workers are standing idle and nothing's happening, which is an even bigger cost. So getting the timing right is a very tricky calculation. And the purchasing department have to, to try to balance the uh, conflicting tensions that are inherent in what I've just said. Orders placed late will run the risk of stock out, as I said, so there are issues. Now, the right supplier. Suppliers should be vetted in terms of reliability, capacity to meet orders, um, quality, uh, support, and price. So suppliers need to uh, be reliable, they need to be able to get the orders when promised and deliver the orders when promised. They must have the capacity to meet the orders. Whatever the size of the order, they should have the capacity to meet it. It should be good quality from them as well. And there should be support. If something goes wrong in the order, the suppliers should be able to support the company. Perhaps get emergency supplies to the company from other sources or uh, make some provision to help out. And they should also, of course, be competitive in their pricing. 
so suppliers need to be to be vetted in terms of economy as well well the last one is the right price clearly the full cost of acquiring the resources is important the full cost is important um, now let's look at efficiency I said there were the three E's so let's move on to efficiency proper itself this aspect of performance measure relates to say the typist example at the start and complications in the measurement should be carefully considered before it is used so I'm working out the productivity of the typist say working uh, on a, an old typewriter could produce let's say 20 words a minute but working with a, a dedicated word processor quite an advanced piece of software could now produce 40 words a minute what's more the words produced are all correctly spelt and in the right position and the grammar is checked for them automatically and it's a much more efficient way of doing it. So does that mean that the productivity of the typist has gone up from 20 words a minute to 40 words a minute or does it mean that the capital has become more productive? So it's it's an issue in terms of efficiency and what we mean by efficiency. It's related to productivity and generally measured this is generally measured by output divided by input so the output would be the number of words accurately typed per minute the input would be the the worker the typist but it's not just the typist the typist is working with the machine as I said the typist needs the machine and the machine is very productive and the machines have become smarter and and more capable does that mean the output then is the uh, is the contribution the sole contribution of the typist well obviously not the the machine has made a contribution effectiveness effectiveness relates to the degree to which output meets customers requirements so the output if it's effective it should meet customers requirements if it's not effective it's just output it's not meeting the customers requirements Customer satisfaction is, is difficult to measure, although customer surveys and focus groups and feedback from sales teams may help. However, generally it's difficult to measure effectiveness. It's difficult to measure customer satisfaction. It is, it's psychological. Where are the customers happy and how happy are the customers with the purchase and with the product? Of course, sales figures may be used as an indicator of effectiveness if more sales are being generated it possibly means that the consumer is happier with the product that the the product is being effective uh, customer needs are being met but it's very difficult to measure it so we've looked at uh, economy, efficiency and effectiveness and those are the three E's of measuring performance and at the start of the video we've had a general discussion uh, about performance indicators and that's all we're going to deal with in this session so we're going to leave it at that and say thank you for watching <laughs>